how amazing is it that we get to live on a unique oasis in space? If we look at uh, exploration and adventure over the centuries, over the thousands of years that we as a species have dreamt of going to the next step, next place, it's the sky down at the bottom of the ocean. We've explored so little of this planet. Let me explain. When we think of our planet as a living space, land-based space may have been by and large explored, at least to a great extent. But if we take into account the ocean layer, the water layer of this planet, and then we take into account that educators, as much as I am a huge supporter of educators, may have gotten it a little bit wrong. Our ocean and our water has not been 72 or 73% of uh, a representation of our planet because now we're talking about the surface. But if you take the third dimension into account, the water part of our planet represents over 99% of the world's living space within which about 92 to 95 percent of the world's biodiversity is and thrives. And yet, if you take all of modern-day ocean exploration, rivers and streams and, and lakes included, we have explored less than 5 percent of that living space. So despite the fact that you may have heard uh, and seen wonderful stories of exploration, thanks to Discovery Channel, Nat Geo, BBC, and folks like uh, my grandfather and many others, we, can, we have yet a lot to explore. And that's what really excites me. Now, some of you may have uh, seen this gentleman before, or maybe <laughs> recognize this gentleman. Uh, I, I don't mean the one with the fashion faux pas on the right-hand side. <laughs> uh, the one in the middle was, in fact, yes, my grandfather, Jack Cousteau. And uh, for those uh, in the audience who may be a little too young to have seen him on television, maybe you can still catch him on YouTube uh, or other uh, social media networks. Uh, he was a pioneer, an out-of-the-box thinker, someone that was frustrated with the limitations of technology and being able to go further, longer, and deeper. And so with that said, uh, being a filmmaker first and foremost, as a young boy and growing up into an adult, and then being introduced to the ocean world uh, throughout the, his, his life in the Navy and even beyond with two of his uh, best friends, uh, Federico Guimard and Capitan Payez, he was fascinated with the underwater world and was, was always uh, eager to go beyond where we could go with that technology at that time. Hence the invention of scuba or the regulator and many other things, the underwater submersibles for some underwater habitats, for some underwater camera housings, uh, size and sonar, uh, many, many, many other things that would allow he and his crew and my grandmother <laughs> uh, to go and circumnavigate the planet and go into places that have never been explored. And for over five decades, 134 documentaries and hopefully hundreds of millions of people around the world were uh, inspired by all of this. Now, some of you that I've gotten uh, the honor of meeting tonight have expressed that you remember fondly those days of the <coughs> Sunday nights at 8 p.m. when the other sea world of Jacques Cousteau uh, was on television. It was, uh, it was quite a, a phenomenal way to grow up, uh, one that I cherish greatly and um, in some ways, I blame uh, for my ocean addiction. When I was a little boy, not much bigger than you, I got a chance uh, of a lifetime. My grandfather uh, was at my birthday, my father, my mother, my, my grandmother, and my father came up to me and said, Fabia, it's good you have to go to the for the gym. Fabia, what would you like for, for lunch for your birthday? You know, friends were around and everything. And we were in uh, uh, this exotic place called Los Angeles. <laughs> <laughs> and as a very uh, good French boy, uh, uh, loving uh, food, I said, Papa, Jim, can you talk to me chicken? <laughs> <laughs> and he 
and so my father just made stunned really. Uh, went off to look for this bucket of mythical Kentucky Fried Chicken in the basin of Los Angeles. Uh, by the time I came back, he came back. I was at the bottom of the pool, buddy, breathing with a family friend. And my family hadn't seen that, had subsequently given me uh, a small pony bottle with a regulator and a suicide strap. Uh, very bad name for it, but it's basically a strap that doesn't allow you to take the mouthpiece out of your mouth. Uh, and uh, off we went to the Channel Islands to go diving. And being able to dive in this alien world and be mesmerized by all these strange creatures, these flashes of color, this just fireworks display of life was mesmerizing to me. The Channel Islands, for example, is if you hit it on a good day and you go through the kelp forest, it looks like a cathedral with the light rays going through the, uh, the rosettes and everything else. And it's just such an amazing, amazing, amazing place. And so I've gotten addicted to this for many years since. And it conjures up something my grandfather used to say, which is, if one person, for whatever reason, gives us a chance to lead an extraordinary life, he or she has no right to keep it to themselves. And it really is the essence of a story maker, a, an adventurer, and someone who wanted to make the world fall in love with this beautiful and unique ecosystem that we live on. The Undersea World of Jacques Cousteau, as I mentioned, was, uh, was a phenomenal uh, series that kept it busy for uh, about 54 years. Uh, but something that many people don't really know is that part of the reason for his success and someone who never wanted to appear on camera was my grandmother, Simone Cousteau. Simone Cousteau was the daughter of an admiral, the granddaughter of an admiral, and she herself wanted to be uh, in the Navy. Unfortunately, they didn't allow uh, women in those days to join, and so uh, her solace or her revenge was to be uh, the true captain of Calypso. <laughs> she spent more time on Calypso than my father, my uncle, and my grandfather combined. And believe me, she was a tough lady, and she was really the reason why my grandfather was so successful. She was so tough and so adamant about not being on camera that I distinctly remember the camera who was a little bit stubborn had kept pointing the camera at her, and finally she had him thrown off the boat. <laughs> Unfortunately, it was in piranha infested waters. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but that really led us to some amazing adventures. This is just one example of, and these are only going to be snapshots because I just don't have time to share with you all the different anecdotal stories. Uh, but we were able to go, for example, in the Humpback National Marine Sanctuary off of Hawaii to go and visit the um, uh, humpback whales. Uh, this is actually, yes, me. I forgot my scuba gear on the deck. Uh, but I wanted to be able to go and immerse myself in uh, the experience of being able to get near uh, a fellow sentient being and a fellow mammal. Uh, this cetacean. I was 60 feet further down than where you see this picture. And I was already about 60 feet down. And so the female sleeping. Now, I don't know if you know much about cetaceans, but they don't ever truly sleep. They only shut down half of their brain, because otherwise, they would drown. They still need to go up to the surface and breathe. And so therefore, they still need to be conscious of their surroundings. And it was just a, a wonderful experience to be able to see eye to eye with an animal that is so enormous and could very easily dispatch me if it wanted to. Uh, and yet, there was a, a connection that I just have a hard time describing. If you ever get a chance to do the same, you'll know what I mean. But there was a, an emotional, an intellectual connection that, that fills your soul and proves to you that there are intelligent creatures, arguably more intelligent than we are, out there in our planet, our own planet. Now, I've been asked to talk a little bit about this. <laughs> Shark Week is coming up. As a young boy, um, my father, uh, who you may have seen a couple of years ago come here in my shirt, uh, Jean-Michel Cousteau, uh, my father, who I spoke with two days ago, 
um, used to take us on uh, the Princess Cruises. Now, do any of you remember the love book? <laughs> You may join me the cruise ship correctly. Um, so the love boat, or the princess cruises, the Pacific, the island princess, and the sun princess originally. They're both all retired, unfortunately, it shows my age. Uh, they uh, were ships that my grandfather, my father, I'm oh, sorry, would lecture on, he would take his family. And I remember the same went to on the Pacific princess. And there was this amazing shark movie that was playing in the theater. I was about seven years old, and I went up to my parents, and said, Mama, Papa, it's because you're ready to watch the film. So I said, I want to be able to get it. And my parents, knowing what film it was, said, uh, I'm sorry, I'm translating to English. <laughs> uh, Mom, Dad, can I go see this shark movie? It's, you know, it's, it's really exciting looking. And my parents, knowing what it was, said, absolutely not. <laughs> and because I'm such a well-behaved child, I said, it anyway. <laughs> and so I had been diving since my ripe old age of four years old, and had seen sharks in the wild on several occasions. And when I was looking up at this screen with an animal that I'd never seen so big, big scary teeth, eating boats, and <laughs> buoys, lots of extra gratuitous blood everywhere, it puzzled me because it wasn't at all what I had seen in nature. And so, you know, I was, I had a burning, burning set of questions and being so intelligent. I went up to my parents and started asking these questions. And subsequently got grounded for over a month. <laughs> <laughs> but it always sat in the back of my mind. And I have a, 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 a up until, well, I think yesterday, uh, I had a passion for cartoons or, or comic books. And uh, Tim Tim, Tim Tim. Uh, it was one of the comic book series that I would always read. And then the Trésor de Rakan was a Rakan's treasure. I always loved because it was, you know, on the front cover you see Tintin and his dog Minou, or Snowy, I think you call him in English, in a shark shaped submarine swimming in the depths. And so I always thought that was cool. And I married those two concepts together one day, a few years ago. You know, we see Shark Week, we see the Nat Geo special, we see all these shark shows all over the place. And they're always the same thing. The ugly, bubbly creatures in the cage, throwing chum at the animals, the animals coming up, doing the big bite thing, you know, great for our cameras, great for sensationalism, but it really doesn't give you that much data on what these animals do when we're not around. You're basically teaching them to do circus tricks. And so why not build a shark-shaped submarine to camouflage yourselves as one of them? Seems simple enough, right? Now, in lieu of time, I didn't bring the video, or I didn't put the, the video on this one, but I'll, I'll summarize it for you. It, it was a show that ended up on CBS uh, Prime Time, which was the first time in over two decades that a natural history documentary was on a network in the United States, one of the four networks. And it got a great rating. We got beaten by Dancing with the Stars, unfortunately. <laughs> But overall, it did really well. And, and the premise was really kind of sneaking science through the back door and using this vehicle to go to an island called Isla Guadalupe, which is full and rife of great white sharks, to go and swim amongst them as one of them. Unfortunately, technology is a, a difficult thing to wrangle as compared to white sharks. And half the time, the submarine submersible ended up on the bottom or skyrocketing on the surface. <laughs> and this uh, intrepid, uh, maybe some would say idiotic, uh, person who invented or, or thought of this idea in the first place uh, would end up outside the sub in shark infested waters. <laughs> so needless to say, if you have dreams, uh, think them through. <laughs> But the short of it is, uh, I, when the submarine worked properly, and uh, no one got hurt, but when the submarine uh, worked properly, we were able to look at the um, uh, communication behavior of white sharks, which was really fascinating. The grimacing, the eye roll movement, the movement, the flexing, the pectoral fins, 
of the positioning in the water, all within the proximity of this white shark uh, submarine. Now, I would never, if there are researchers in the group, uh, this is task -loading. You're on a rebreather, you're testing, you're using a, an animatronic animal that's propelled by fish propulsion through pneumatic systems uh, that break every other time. Uh, the comms were out 65% of the time, so I couldn't communicate to my service team, despite the fact I was pinned to the bottom. Uh, there was one time where uh, I decided, hey, this is working great enough. Let's do this at night. <laughs> Why not? I mean, you know, as if it difficult to learn. Uh, and uh, that was really the crux of what CBS latched onto, and, and we really stuck as much of the uh, the, the shark, shark uh, or etiology uh, science uh, through the back of through that. But I did get stuck at the bottom one time. Uh, one of the pneumatic lines broke. Uh, the surface team, of course, typically as everything happens, you know, uh, if something goes wrong, everything goes wrong. Comms went out, and I was basically alone at the bottom of the sea. Uh, or my other option was to float to the surface and float out to the Pacific forever. Uh, and I decided to anchor at the bottom, and I had a very nice short 200 meter swim from the shark sub anchored at the bottom to a elephant seal rope reed, which was a favorite snack of white sharks. <laughs> at 9.30 uh, at night, when it was pitch dark in the water. So I think, you know, when someone was asking me earlier, were you ever afraid uh, of anything in the water? And usually I'll say, yes, human beings. Uh, typically is what I'm afraid of in the water. But in this particular case, it was probably the closest to that uh, uncertainty. Uh, and uh, I even bumped into a bull elephant seal underwater uh, that evening, which certainly uh, made me think twice about doing it again. <laughs> Especially after the next day when I saw a bull elephant seal's head bobbing on the surface, uh, presumably a shark snack. Uh, and these are 3,000 uh, 3, pound animals, so you can imagine. But anyway, on to the next one. So that was Mind of a Demon, and, and it was, uh, to me, was a testament to the fact that people still loved animals, even sharks that have been over, over discussed. Um, and uh, something that we can bring the general public in, regardless of what the audience is, whether they're uh, shark fanatics or people who never watched a documentary in the first place, provided you know how to address the topic and bring the viewership in, in an appropriate way. Sometimes we play with uh, fun animals uh, in rivers. Uh, this is a caiman uh, in the Amazon River. Uh, this particular little critter is uh, flanked by the three Cousteaus. Uh, the gentleman with the funny hair in the middle is my father, who you've probably met. And, uh, you know, it's, it's really about being able to tell a narrative that brings in the human adventure. The human adventure into these strange and, and mysterious places. Not only to inspire young people to go out there and have their own adventures, but just as importantly, to connect the importance of this amazing miracle we call planet Earth, which should actually be called planet Ocean. We've occasionally had the opportunity uh, in some unfortunate circumstances to um, help uh, some experts rescue animals. Uh, that's not our job. Uh, our job is to uh, make stories and, and and share them with the world as much as possible, uh, create education opportunities for people to really get immersed in the experiences. But in this particular case, there was a baby orca that got stranded in uh, the North Island of New Zealand, and uh, Dr. Inga Visser, an orca biologist, had asked for our help to help transport her from one side of the island to the other. And we held vigil all night long to make sure that she was as comfortable as possible uh, before we released her on the other side of the island, presumably to um, to release her uh, with her pod. Now we ended up calling her Reiki because her uh, her tail fin had been uh, scarred and raped by the adult orcas who had grabbed onto her and tried to pull her off the sandbank to try and pull her back into deeper water. Uh, so she does have some scars there, uh, but she's also the culprit for having two of our expedition team end up getting married right then and there, thanks to Reiki and their rings. 
actually, when you put them together, the wedding rings have the same rate marks on her back uh, tail on their rings. So we do uh, tend to get very close to our subjects, <laughs> both emotionally and with cameras. Um, a couple of years ago, Another crazy idea came to me uh, that was a dream from uh, when I was a boy. My grandfather built uh, some of the first underwater habitats. And for those who don't know what that is, an underwater habitat is essentially a house underwater. It's used typically um, as a uh, research lab uh, or for certain experiments. Uh, and there was, up until this year, only one remaining underwater research station in the world, and that was called Aquarius. Aquarius is nine miles offshore of the Florida Keys and 20,000 millimeters down, as one of our scientists said, which is 20, the fancy was saying 20 meters or 60 feet, see my feet. And I had a chance to visit um, her deepness, uh, a friend of the family's uh, by the name of Dr. Sylvia Earl, who I've known since I was four. And um, I, she was trying to save Aquarius back in 2012 when uh, no one was going to pull the habitat out. And it conjured back up the old stories that my grandfather had about living underwater. Like an astronaut lives in an international space station, living underwater in a habitat is like being uh, an aquanaut. Uh, the same extreme challenges are, are there, and there are, of course, some extra parameters. For example, we're under pressure, as uh, astronauts are, without uh, pressure, but certainly uh, not more than 14.7 psi. Uh, and uh, it, was, it was always an interesting thing. I always loved the idea of having that tool at our disposal, because as opposed to uh, land-based uh, studies of the ocean or of water systems, as opposed to being on a boat, as opposed to sending out an ROV or an AUV going in submersible, being an aquanaut gives you one thing that none of those other tools give you, the luxury of time. Because as an aquanaut, you saturate. You, the definition of an aquanaut is being at pressure depth for over 24 hours. Aquarius is a very luxurious 600 internal square feet, or about the size of a New York City apartment, within which six aquanauts live. Very cozy, uh, none of the luxuries of home. <laughs> uh, we were able to uh, use the galley, of course, which is basically a microwave or hot water, and eat astronaut food for 31 days, which as a French person is probably the hardest thing I had to do. <laughs> but with that said, uh, even though it's only 60 feet down, as you are saturated there, as opposed to a scuba diver, when you're taught to scuba dive, you're taught that the surface is your safe zone. If there's a problem, go to the surface. As an aquanaut, absolutely not. It's the other way around. The, the habitat is your safe zone. You're not allowed to go up to the surface. Because if you do, within 15 minutes, nasty little things happen like paralysis and death. So what that does allow you to do, though, as opposed to surface-based research or even exploration, is it gave us that luxury of time. As a very basic example, during those 31 days in that very comfortable location, we were able to scuba dive on average 10 to 12 hours a day each. We basically had unlimited time. And that allows us to go even wander further down into the ravine, 150 feet, five and a half hours, no deco time. Uh, and so on and so forth. And that really gives you much more immersive experience and much more ability to study that local ecosystem, to <clears throat> extract the, the data that you need and analyze it back in the lab within the habitat. So uh, I, I won't go into too many details. Maybe for the q and I'll be able to, to answer some questions. I'm sure one of the kids here will ask us, uh, ask me how uh, we went to the bathroom. This is a good question. So I just got that question. Uh, but there are a lot of really interesting uh, experiments there. But that said, I want to share with you a one and a half minute piece that kind of summarizes Mission 31, where we say 31 days at the world's last remaining underwater habitat. I want 
you to meet Captain Jacques Yves Cousteau, the world's foremost underwater explorer. Once upon a time, my grandfather believed that man could live and work beneath the waves. We began to look at the ocean differently. He inspired me and generations to explore the human ocean connection. It was a whole new world, a world without sun. And in 1964, he lived and worked for 30 days on the ocean floor. But then something happened. We lost our way. Countless frontiers unexplored. Oceans that need our help more than ever. It's time for a reboot to re-spark the human ocean connection. My name is Fabian Cousteau. Join me and my crew on a journey to Aquarius, the last undersea habitat, and prove that there is a future for us beneath the waves. Everywhere. If you're going there today, and I go there all the time, 
it is a ghost town compared to what it used to be. Now, an average person may, that haven't seen it back then, may go in there and say, wow, this is beautiful, it's a lot of fun, this is great, there's sharks, there's you know, some sort of parrotfish, and so on and so forth. But the reality is it's, it's nothing like what it should be. And that concept of shifting baselines is, is another uh, issue that we have to tackle. And that we have to understand what things, how they should be. And you know, there's a, a I work with the United Nations, and they've got the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, and there are a lot of them out there. So SDG 14 happens to be the one for life underwater, fresh and and salt. And uh, it's part of, of a, a wheel of things that are culminated into cities, food, land, refining of uh, uh, climate change and energy, and then. Refining or redefining the values. Because if we look at our planet, it's a natural resource bank account. Even if I didn't care one iota about conservation, we need to see this as our life support system and start living off the interest that it bears rather than eating away what's left of the capital, lest our children have to clean up our mess even uh, more so than we have to already. Now, the Fabian Cousteau Ocean Learning Center is there official name of it, we should call it the OLC, on some of the times I don't want to hear my name. Uh, our focus is really about that education and empowerment through uh, various means. Sometimes we take uh, young aspiring marine biologists down in submarine dives. We're having a terrible time, as you can tell. Uh, <laughs> this was in Curacao. Uh, we borrowed the Curacao. Uh, and this young lady uh, is a local of Curacao who uh, won the, uh, the science prize in her school, uh, which uh, meant basically that we got to take her on a submarine ride and have a great time. Uh, we took some specimens while we were down uh, at about 1,000 feet. And it was overall just a, a wonderful experience to, to expose her to, uh, to things that she had never seen before. Sometimes we recruit them uh, nice and young. I think that used to be called indentured servant too. Much. <laughs> uh, these young boys are actually boys of one of my uh, educators uh, that works with the Ocean Learning Center. Uh, they're planting mangroves. Uh, of course, most of our <laughs> participants are not quite that young, uh, but we're able to talk about mangroves as an amazing uh, uh, bush or tree that is the largest carbon sequester of any tree, which is pretty awesome. It's also a great storm barrier from storm surges and hurricanes and so on and so forth. And coupled with coral reefs are some of the most rich in uh, biodiversity for spawning grounds in the ocean. And so all those, uh, all those narratives are done through activities. Uh, we get to release some baby sea turtles. Uh, this is in El Salvador. We were able to engage over 800 uh, tortugueros, or fishermen, and their families for over three years in a place that had a zero recruitment rate of baby sea turtles. And thanks to uh, uh, our team's guidance and their management of their local beaches over 34 kilometers worth, those same fishermen that were blamed for the decimation of those five endangered you know, sea turtle populations because of the gathering of eggs we're able to release over 750,000 baby sea turtles in just three years. So we can make change if we think outside the box and, and address things in various different ways. And lastly, one of my favorites, which is one of the newer programs that we have, is using technology to look at how we can restore our aquatic uh, 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 ecosystem. These are actually 3D printed corals, or the structure of coral. And what we do is basically use uh, all organic materials. We hack printers, 3D printers, and we have kids, uh, and kids at heart, like me, uh, go and create uh, different structures with calcium carbonate and a proprietary uh, organic binder. Uh, and we are able to create the basic structure of a coral, invite the zooxanthellae, which are the coral polyps, to uh, populate those corals. And we've had a 15 to 20% higher success rate than uh, the traditional coral fragging and other uh, programs that are out there that we used to do as well. Uh, I just got sick and tired of zip ties and PVC and other things that are just really ugly underwater and end up inevitably in our ecosystem. 
And so we're, we're having a lot of fun with that as well. But the idea really is, and something that I'm, I'm really excited about here at the Aquarium, is connecting these young people who will, uh, who we borrowed this planet from, to be able to be better stewards than we've ever been because of that one secret weapon that we have, which is communications, being able to engage people, voice our concerns, give them opportunities for solutions and innovation. And by and large, look at things like this. If my grandfather had this, imagine how many more people he could have touched. We have this opportunity. Over 7.8 billion people on this planet, and we're able to communicate with each and every one of them. So despite the fact that we're tackling the, uh, what I call the three dark horsemen, which are climate change related issues, uh, pollution issues, which come from upstream, believe it or not, 80% of that garbage that's in the ocean is from land-based sources way upstream. Over 35,000 pieces of plastic are in our ocean, every square mile of it. So we have to raise the alarm bells. I hate to always do that because I like to talk about good news stuff. But it really is the basis of our decision making, being able to be um, educated about this in an impassioning way. I have in my, my uh, pocket my number one enemy. Uh, this is, a, this is a, a, a destructive weapon that is killing all sorts of things. This happens to be a very long strike. I don't know why I picked it long. It doesn't fit in my pocket. But, um, but plastic is a huge, huge difference. We go to places a thousand miles away from civilization, down to the bottom of the sea, or to a beach where no one's ever been. And we see plastic everywhere, sometimes eight feet high. In the ocean, in the gyres, in certain places, you see plastic 90 feet thick. And in other places, it's a soup so fine you can't even see it. But here's the problem. Animals eat that stuff. And then we eat the sea life. So by the, at the end of the day, even if you don't care about biodiversity, which I'm sure everyone here does because you're out of the brain, not at all, we are eating our own garbage. That's kind of gross. So maybe we can make better decisions. Our single use plastic is an easy one to solve if we all band together and do it. Imagine all these people in this room, you, you know, the average person in America consumes over eight pieces of single use plastics every single day. Use it to discard, use it to discard. Thing that's, things that are made to last 500 years or more that we use for 30 seconds, 30 minutes, or less. We can at least get rid of at least one per day, I would hope. And look how much of a positive impact we would have. And I commend the, uh, the aquarium for uh, not offering straws and plastic um, uh, on, that, on that account. And this is really, I, I love this picture because this shows how we are all connected. The, this is a, uh, a rendering, I'm sorry, I'll step down so you all can see them all. This is a rendering of all the different river systems in the United States alone. Of course, they all end up in the ocean. And this, these are the veins, these are the roots of our aquatic planet. And so with that said, it's of paramount importance that we take care of our fresh water bodies. And as was mentioned before, and I don't think uh, you saw this picture, guys, but uh, this was a picture we took, uh, I'm sorry, I took this afternoon with my little GoPro of all the uh, troublemakers of the aquarium <laughs> and the institute. But we had such a great time. What was the river's name again? I keep forgetting the river. Kanasawa. Kanasawa. It was a phenomenal place. I don't know if anyone of you has got snorkeling there, but wow, I mean, I, the river tasted good. Now, I've gone diving in the Hudson River. I've gone diving in the Mississippi. I've gone diving in other, the Yangtze and other things. I gotta tell you, you have the best, best tasting river I've ever tasted. And more so than that, it was crystal clear and there was life everywhere, fish everywhere. And that's just a testament to showing how things can happen if we all make an effort to make sure that this is there for these guys. And that is just an amazing, amazing thing. And so with that said, water connects us all. And 
at the end of the day, it goes back to what my grandfather used to say, which is people protect what they love, they love what they understand, and they understand what they're taught. If we don't want to go bankrupt, we need to all row in the same direction. And with that said, there are three ways we can do that. Well, there are many ways we can do that, but the three ideas that can be had, which is number one, the straw or plastics, get rid of these in our lives. I'm not saying get rid of all plastic because plastic is useful in the right ways, but considering there's endocrine disruptors in here, why are we using this at all in our food system? Number two, maybe use, if you, if you eat sea life, or a water life, uh, use an app like the Seafood Watch Guide, if you don't already. It's an easy tool, it's free. You use it at a restaurant, use it at the supermarket. If you see something that's not sustainable, like uh, bluefin tuna, or, uh, you know, for example, bluefin tuna is down to less than 2% of the original number in the Atlantic, it's almost extinct. Um, you know, use it as a tool, as, a, as an empowering, thing, you know, talk to the manager of the restaurant. Hey, you know what? I really love your restaurant. I don't think you should serve tuna anymore or, or swordfish. No more. And I want to keep, you know, you, you have the ultimate vote. You're, you're the ultimate, you're, we're all consumers. And as consumers, we have the ultimate vote, but we also have the responsibility to speak up. And the last one, of course, is using our mobile devices, uh, devices to empower other ones, professionals, and, and speak up. Because right now, we're facing a uh, administration that is not after our best interests as far as nature is concerned. And nature, at the end of the day, is not a And it's something that we all depend on. Uh, so we need to speak up and say, hey, if you're representing us, we want you to make sure that you're representing our future well-being. Because politics, unfortunately, is a short-term uh, job. We're here for the rest of our lives, and I hope that that will be a wonderful place that we can give back to our children in a better state than we found. So we need to motivate our uh, representatives to do the right thing, to make the right decisions. So with that said, I'm going to uh, leave it as I thought I went way over my time. So I don't know if uh, I... Let's give a round of applause for Thank you.